So the Theosophical Society is tasked with creating the nucleus of a new society, in a sense, a society of divine wisdom where there isn't distinctions, culture, gender, ethnicity, but rather the realization that humans and all life are indeed one. The forms uh, may vary, but the life and soul in them, the consciousness is one and the same. So to help us achieve that um, idealistic objective, we encourage a study of comparative religion, philosophy, and science, and the investigation into the unexplored nature, laws of nature, and ourselves. Um, the society uh, has no dogmas or creeds, and freedom of thought is encouraged. So as members, uh, we're in all working together throughout the world to um, implement those objects. So tonight is our first um, session, first evening um, of the Wellington branch, where we're going to uh, celebrate ADI Day. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Pedro Oliveira, um, who's currently um, residing in Australia, has been there for many years. Um, Pedro joined the Theosophical Society in Brazil in uh, 1978, uh, and he's worked uh, for the society ever since in various capacities. And this includes um, working at the international headquarters in uh, Chennai, uh, India. Um, and that was between 1992 and 96. Um, he's, he's been the um, coordinator and education coordinator in the TS in the Australian section, he's currently living. Um, he was the officer in charge of the editorial office whilst working in Adyar. And he's also um, been uh, the international secretary and the president of the Indo Federation. Um, uh, Pedro has also written um, uh, several books, uh, including um, The Entry Rama Life of Beneficence and Wisdom. Um, CWL uh, Speaks, and um, the Crisis in the Theosophical Society in 2018, and Annie Besson in India. So um, he's, Pedro has done a lot of work for the society, and we're very fortunate to have him speak with us. So uh, and many of you, some of you have met um, Pedro when I mean, he's been in New Zealand and overseas. So um, Pedro, over to you, and thanks for being with us in Wellington Lodge, and for everyone who's joining in from um, New Zealand and anywhere else. Thanks. Thank you, Simon. I also thank Sushma for the invitation to address uh, the the, uh, the members of Wellington Lodge and uh, from uh, other lodges in New Zealand as well. Um, um, uh, for some good reason, Zoom has enabled us to continue to meet, even if not physically, so we can still uh, continue this inquiry. I, I have said this uh, more than once that um, one of the very extraordinary characteristics of the Theosophical Society is that um, um, it, it is not a belief-based organization, but it's an inquiry-based organization. So it, it, it really uh, encourages all of, of us as members and the public who come to us to inquire, to find out about Theosophy and and to see what aspects of theosophy, the theosophical teachings um, can help us in our daily lives and so on. So it's a great privilege to be in the TS. And uh, um, I joined uh, when I was a, a young man in Brazil in 1978. And I never thought in my wildest dreams that so many opportunities would have been given to me. So. Adya Day is a very special day. Uh, it's the day that uh, in, in which lodges and members worldwide remember Adya as the international headquarters. Um, a little bit of history, very briefly. The society was founded in, in the US, in New York, uh, in 1878. But soon after it was founded, the um, uh, the two principal co-founders of the TS, of course, there were 17 founders, but the two principal co-founders, Madame Blavatsky and Corner Alcott, decided to go to India in search of a permanent headquarters for the TS. And they, 
they 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 reached a certain consensus that the place for the headquarters should have a certain ethos or atmosphere, if you like, right? Because the nature they saw the nature of the work of the society as being quintessentially spiritual. The society is not is not an academic body. It has a number of academicians in its ranks. For example, here in Australia, we have for many decades. Uh, Dr. Victor Gostin, uh, who is a distinguished uh, um, geologist as a member of the TS, Dr. Olga Gostin, uh, an anthropologist and so on, uh, Dr. Dada Tatre, who has a, a degree in philosophy of science. So the society doesn't uh, welcome inter intellectuals and academicians, but by nature, the society is not an academic body. Anybody who agrees uh, with uh, with the formulation of the three objects and pay the necessary fees is entitled to join. So they 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 started their search. So they left New York in November, eighteen seventy eight, and they landed in Bombay in February, eighteen seventy nine. And um, initially. They, they rented a place called Crow's Nest. <laughs> it's a, the, there are many quirk names in the history of the society. And this was the, the house where they stayed in, in Bombay. In that time, Bombay, uh, at that time, Bombay was still called Bombay, not Mumbai. So, uh, and the headquarters was there. And it was there in October, 1879, that Madame Blavatsky founded the official journal of the TS, The Theosophist, which is still in existence and a monthly journal. Uh, the Australian section has contributed to, by creating an index of theosophical periodicals, and you can find all the issues, all the contents of all the issues of The Theosophist from October, 1879, to February 2022, which is, it's quite a feat, but, um, and it helps the research as well. So, but they, they realized that Crow's Nest would not be the permanent headquarters for some reason. So some members from Madras invited them to go to Madras, uh, which is, a, a, was the, which is the, the, the capital of South India, so, so to speak, and um, uh, uh, Madras uh, at that time was well known for attracting very profound and serious pundits. That means pundit in, in India is someone who has a profound knowledge of Sanskrit and the Shastras, the Hindu scriptures. Uh, not many people can, can uh, do that, but they could. And, um, but Colonel Alcott said in one of his... Uh, in one of the passages of Old Diary Leaves that it was the presence of Swami T. Subha Rao who attracted them to, to, to Madras because they not only, they had met him and uh, uh, he was a young lawyer in the Madras High Court at that time. Uh, in, 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 in India, they would call a lawyer at that time a vakil or, or a pleader. <laughs> Right, and um, he, and he, he was a, a very profound occultist, and Madame Blavatsky had such a regard for him for him that she wanted him to edit, help her to edit the the secret doctrine. Just imagine, she wouldn't invite anybody to edit the secret doctrine, but she did invite Subarau and. Um, Eventually, he, he didn't agree to some of her um, um, uh, con some of the content she included. She felt she was talking too much about the adepts, too much about the masters, and he was an initiated Brahmin, and she, he wouldn't talk about uh, subjects like initiation and adepts and so on. So he withdrew, but he continued as a member of of the TS. So. They, they, Madame Lavatkin and Colonel Alcott went to Madras in May 1883, sorry, 1882, 
they went there and um, and they were driven to Adyar and Colonel Oko said, the moment we saw Adyar, we knew that our future home had been found. And he was uh, very moved for that, by that. And then uh, he was in, in what today is the headquarters hall. Of course, the headquarters hall has been modified from the original design, but uh, there was there is still a core area which is, which is the original uh, hall of the headquarters. And uh, he was discussing with members how a, a strategy to obtain financial loan to pay for that property, 53 acres, right? It was called Huddlestone Gardens at that time. And, um, and then um, uh, while the, he was, this Cornwall was a very, was a very objective man, uh, uh, a, a man with experience. He was a lawyer. He, he prosecuted corruption in the American army uh, uh, during the, the Civil War, and he did receive death threats and so on. And um, so he was discussing the practical details. In the meantime, Madame Blavatsky went to the roof of the property. When she came back, she said to Colonel Okot, Master wants this place bought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Colonel Awkward, then <laughs> he realized that it was not time to continue extensive uh, prospective uh, studies about what to do. He, 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 with the help of a number of Indian members in Madras, they bought that property or they leased it. And, uh, and they moved in in December, 1882. So ADR completed its, its first centenary in December, 1982. And at that time, Mr. J. Krishnamurti planted a tree there. The, the, the convention there was uh, overflowing with delegates. Uh, I, I remember I was uh, in Brazil and I used to receive the Theosophist by air mail. And I was so uh, enthralled when, when the, the um, the December issue of the Theosophist arrived, not the, the December, the February issue arrived because it contained all the talks of the convention, including discussions with Fritjof Capra, Rupert Sheldrake, Krohit Mehta, Radha Bournier, and so on. And Rene Weber, a very distinguished member of the uh, American section. So, so this is the, this, these are the beginnings of ADR. And some, uh, um, members maintain, I think, with a good deal of common sense and reason, that the fact that Madame Blavatsky lived there for three years, she, she moved there in December 1882 and she left for Euro Europe in March 1885, she really established a certain link between ADR and certain, let us say, uh, special places uh, be, beyond the Himalayas, um, where the elder brethren uh, live, and because she had this capacity to establish that link, she was trained to establish that link. Uh, very, very little is known about her occult training in Tibet, except that uh, Miss Mary Neff, she, she she wrote some articles about this, and she discovered in in some of Madame Blavatsky's letters to Sinet. Uh, what happened to her when she was there. And you know, that's a different story. So um, the founders lived there, and Madame Blavatsky had to leave because the founders experienced a great deal of difficulties and an unparalleled level of betrayal, even from members. You know, it's very difficult to explain. But for example, Two people from the Adyar household, whom Madame Blavatsky had rescued from poverty, Monsieur and Madame Coulomb, they liaised with the missionaries, Christian missionaries in Madras, to set her up and saying that she was performing bogus phenomena at Adyar. And then the Society for Psychical Research in London sent in an investigation, investigator. This is all history. And um, he was quite biased in the way that he approached the, the investigation. And uh, he then proclaimed her as a, some kind of a forger or so. 
uh, one year, 100 years later, an article was published in the Journal of the Society for Psychical Research by an expert in calligraphy, and therefore in fraud, in written fraud. His name was Vernon Harrison, and um, he said that the, the report was very biased and, and it was not really impartial or scientific. She decided she had to leave because her health was compromised. Uh, and um, and um, um, uh, and then, of course, a new phase started because Colonel Alcott's health declined. Dr. Bezan succeeded him, and Dr. Bezan expanded the, the size of IDR from 53 acres to 253 acres, which is the size. Uh, she bought adjoining property, so she secured that land for the posterity for the society. And she also had the capacity of attracting very dedicated workers. So a, a, a great deal of work was done at ADR, um, including inspirational work for uh, prisoners. You know, they, they, they would prepare theosophical material for prisoners. And for example, great institutions in India, like the Young Women's Indian Association, they were founded there. They commemorated the centenary a few years ago uh, and they thanked uh, Dr. Bess and, uh, uh, for that. And as a matter of fact, the president of India came to that uh, 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 meeting and there is a photograph of him bowing to the statue of Dr. Bess. so it was quite significant. Um, so, and of course, uh, one event that uh, happened at IDR is that uh, a brother Ledbeater, uh, who, who, who was a trained clairvoyant, he saw some boys playing on the beach. He used to go to the beach for swimming at around 5 p.m. And, uh, and he, he mentioned to Mr. Er Ernest Wood that one of those boys would be a great speaker and a great teacher because he, he had a very special aura. Uh, he actually said, these are his original words, there was no particle of selfishness in his aura. And this is the boy known as J. Krishnamurti. There is a whole history behind that. We don't have the time. So he was trained in exercise. He, he was taught how to ride a bicycle. His diet was, uh, was regulated as well. And, um, and then Dr. Bezan obtained the guardianship of him and his brother. And she sent them to Europe for studying. Um, a great deal of writing took place at ADR during that time. You can see the books, not only by Annie Besson and Lady Peter, by others as well. There are fascinating articles in the Theosophist about that. One of the articles that drew my attention is in the museum at ADR, we have a kind of a, a Tibetan manuscript, a partial Tibetan manuscript, a leaf. Uh, and the librarian of the the, uh, of the TS at IDR did some study and they couldn't make a, a, a connection with the past. They were finding it difficult. So he came to Brother Ledbeater and he did some investigation. And he said, this manuscript is connected with Nagarjuna. So they continued to investigate and, and they, they said that Mr. Ledbeater was right. They even they even located from which folio in the manuscript from Nagarjuna that leaf was. Um, ADR has the beautiful headquarters building. Uh, a number of you have been there. Um, it's very special. It has the museum. Um, it has the ADR library. The, the beginnings of the ADR library were um, very interesting because um, um, because of the British government in India, a sense was created among the pundits and people having rare manuscripts that the British basically shamed them in believing that Sanskrit was an important language. The, the British had, had said that Sanskrit was a dead language and all education had to be in English and so on. Just imagine those of you who have studied the Bhagavad Gita or the Upanishads or the yoga aphorisms to consider that dead language. But that was the attitude of the British 
uh, officialdom. And when the Hindus uh, realized the work that Corno Awkward and Madame Blavatsky and others were doing, they became more confident and they, they brought him some very rare manuscripts that they had stored in their houses. And every, and Cornwallis tra traveled extensively to India and he collected some so rare manuscripts, you know, in no, Pali manuscripts, Sanskrit manuscripts, Tamil manuscripts. Recently, the Tamil manuscripts have been cataloged by the Adya Library. So, and, um, and the Adyar Library receives uh, academic publications in Eastern thought, Eastern philosophy, Indology, and so on from around the world. And it receives uh, scholars and so on. Uh, it has a very nice reading room. Those of you who have been there know that. Um, and it has in the hall of the reading room, one of the beautiful paintings of Sri Shankaracharya, you know, and uh, who, who was considered by Madame Blavatsky a very great adept, a very great teacher. So we have the library, we have a number of residences as well. Um, a, a former president of the TS, Radha Bournier, lived by the, by the beach and uh, near the beach and her house is called Parsi Quarters. And she explained to me that that building was built by the Parsi community, mostly from Bombay. And it had many partitions and later on it became more spacious and so on. Um, um, besides that, we have some highlights in the life of ADR, which are the international convention, which not, uh, at the moment they can't be held with people because of the pandemic. But also we have the School of the Wisdom, which was started by Mr. Jinnaraj Adas in 1949. And I'm, some of you had the opportunity to, to attend the School of the Wisdom. Many eminent theosophists spoke there, um, 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 including uh, uh, Clara Cord, Mr. Geoffrey Hodgson, Mr. Sri Ram, um, uh, Ian T. Hoskins, and, and many, many, many others. Um, so, but there is something about IDR that, that it, it's difficult to describe it because it's not the buildings, it's not the activities, it's the place itself. And the best designation that I have found over the years to explain the spirit of IDR, the atmosphere of IDR is, was given in a book by C.R. Groves. He and his wife, Daisy Groves, they were TS members from England. He was the general secretary of the TS in England. And he wrote a book about Adyar and he said something about Adyar that I could never forget. And I think it's very precise. He said, at Adyar, unlike many other places, one realizes that the center of life is everywhere except in the personal self. The center of life is everywhere except in the personal self. And theosophical literature confirms that, you know, we, we are human, we tend to be self-centered, we, th we, we tend, we think that this is um, uh, um, uh, uh, normal and so on, but by being self-centered, we miss very much of what the, the nature of life is. And, um, uh, Mr. Sri Ram, our fifth president, he said, there is an extraordinariness in life. Every form of life is extraordinary. And, um, and, and to be a real student of the author implies to, to become sensitive to this. Because if you can become sensitive to this extraordinariness of life, you are not you are not going to affirm yourself or um, callously or uh, indulge in criticism of others or disharmony you know the, all these things belong to the personal self the buddha was slightly more blunt i must say that perhaps i do i have two minutes simon yeah um the buddha said to his disciples this is not part of a 
public sermon of the Buddha. It, it's part of one of one of his sermons to his disciples. He called them bhikkhus, right? They are monks or disciples. He was talking about the self. He, he wanted to convey to them the dangerous nature of the self. And um, he said, the self is like a stranger that knocks on the door of a householder in the middle of the night. The householder has a rural property, a family, servants, animals. He is happy there. This stranger knocks on his door and the householder opens the door and says, um, I'm very tired, I'm very uh, uh, hungry. If you give me accommodation for one night, I'll leave in the morning uh, and something to eat, something small. So the householder looks at him and takes pity on him and gives him accommodation for one night. In the morning, his family meets the householder, the, the stranger, they like him and, and the householder allow him to stay for one more day, three days, one week, one month, three months, six months permanently. One night, the stranger walks into, when the house was completely silent, he walks into the bedroom of the householder with a knife. He kills the householder and takes over the, 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 the property. And the Buddha said, the stranger is the self. We indulge in horse trading with the self. We indulge in self-justification and so on. Um, and Mr. Groves was basically saying that if we become obsessed with our personal self, with ourselves, we cannot see the big picture, which is life. And this is one of the, this is one of the opportunities that ADR gives. I have lived there for some years. I have seen people arriving in the dead of the night at Leadbeater Chambers to stay there for the School of the Wisdom for two and a half months. And they came down next morning for, for, for coffee. They attended one class. They went back to their room, packed, and they left. Because uh, they, couldn't, they couldn't bring themselves to, to live in that kind of atmosphere. Other people, they complained about everything, about the food, about the mattress, about the pillowcase, about the pillow, uh, about the sink, and so on. And um, so these things happen. But what is connected with all this is the sense of self. Finally, ADR has some important social activities. Corner Awkward founded many schools. Most of them he'd handed over to the government. But the society wanted to keep the awkward Memorial High School in homage to his service and dedication. And it's still there. And it is dedicated to the poorest of the poor. A number of students come from the Kupams in Chennai, which has means seaside villages, right? And, um, and these children, they receive meals, uniform, books, medical attention, and, and many things. And some of them, um, some of them uh, obtain professions later in life. We also have the Social Welfare Center, which, is, uh, which is, um, uh, helps uh, women. Many women, poor women in Madras, in Chennai, have been deserted by their husbands because of alcoholism. Alcoholism is a serious problem in India. So the TS helps them by teaching them how to sew and help them to finance a, a sewing machine. And then, and in the meantime, the, the, this uh, vocational training center for women, uh, they leave their children in the social welfare center, very poor kids, uh, and they are attended there. Um, and this, um, uh, this has been going on for many, many years. I, I was uh, at the airport with Mrs. Radha Bournier. She was departing to Australia in January 1995 to attend the 
centenary convention of the Australian section. And I had been told by her travel agent that I should speak to the supervisor of Singapore Airlines um, um, so that they could give her an upgrade. She was an elderly lady at that time. So with difficulty, I convinced the guard at the gate of the check-in area to walk in with her. We processed her luggage. Then when we were walking towards the Singapore Airlines counter, a young man dressed in uniform with a Singapore Airlines uniform and silk tie and um, uh, came to her and, and he said, you are Mrs. Bernier, aren't you? So Radha Bernier was a bit uh, uh, startled and he said, yes, how do you know? He said to her, I studied in the occult school. So she had this, her smile was very white. <laughs> um, and, um, and also she inherited from her father a specific work of helping poor people in need um, um, in their medical needs and so on. And, uh, and Norma Shastri, who was a longtime resident, helped to manage that kind of activity to uh, cater for poor people. So Adyar is a complete headquarters that is uh, study, uh, office work, uh, charitable activity, service, and then there is nature. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, anyone have any questions, Peter, comments? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll just mention something in terms of, you know, having that experience, you know, I was able to go there as a, as a young theosophist, I was 28, um, and I joined the society about five years earlier, and I'd been working um, uh, in the HPB Lodge in Auckland, um, you know, getting in involved in the work, and sharing it, you know, the message with my young um, friends and and uh, I got sponsored to go over. So I did the School of the Wisdom with Ravi Ravindra in 95, January, February on, was the Bhagavad Gita, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali and the Bhagavad Gita um, and uh, Gospel of John, yeah. So that's really, really amazing. Um, so yeah, if you can ever get to Adyar, please try and get there. I mean, there's lots of little stories about people who have lived there and worked there, but it is, you know, something about Adyar. You know, you go there um, and something takes you over. I had, you know, the longest I've stayed there was three months, but um, I've been there a few times. Um, and obviously, you know, I'd met Sushma when I first went there and then 13 years later um, when we got married. But um, it's like, yeah, there's something about Adyar, you know. There's some, you can't kind of name it, but you, you know what you mean if you've been there. And it's interesting, um, if you go there with an open mind, an open heart, then you know, Agile will look after you. If you don't, it will also look after you in a different way. <laughs> Do you have anything to add, Sushi, from your time in Agile? Because you'd work there as well. Well, yes, I met Pedro. Uh... Well, I, my grandmother first met Pedro uh, and she told us we were all kids and she said, I met Pedro and Idarmus, um, who are, they had just arrived in Adyar to do work and we were all there for the international convention. So I've known Pedro for a very, very long time. And he's even visited our grandparents' house in Dodbalapur. Uh, and then I, when I went to work there at the age of 21, Pedro was the international secretary and I was in the editorial office. So yes, uh, just like Simon, I really recommend a visit to Adyar. And thank you so much, Pedro, for today, for sharing with us the historical and the, even the current uh, life in Adyar at the moment. Yes. Um, the you. work that goes on so silently. I mean, there's so much that goes on there, um, which is uh, worth mentioning. Your grandmother, 
uh, I had just bought in the bookshop uh, a very expensive book printed in the US called The Letters of H.P. Blavatsky to A.P. Sinet. And I was beginning to read when Mrs. Kamala, your grandmother, saw it. She said, would you lend it to me? <laughs> I said, of course. So she read it and then she put a very nice paper cover, cover around it. So her handwriting is still in the book. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. It was, uh, she was very, very, uh, you know, dedicated. She would translate all the School of Wisdom notes into Canada and distribute it in the, among the members. So that's why she probably borrowed the book so she could make some notes from it. Um, I've got something to show you. So this is a picture which has Kushma's grandmother we're talking about in here. This is from 1995, the School of the Wisdom. You may or may not be able to see it. Yeah, this is the School of the Wisdom, isn't it? Yeah. With Ravi Ravindra. Yeah, Ravi Ravindra. So, um, so right, where are we? Okay, right at the very bottom, uh, down here, is Sushma's grandmother. That's my grandmother on the right, bottom right, and there's Simon in the same row, second from the left. Yes. And so, Erica, Erica is sitting on the foreground. <laughs> Yes, Erika is there too. And there's uh, some uh, two other New Zealand members there too. There's Arthur Goodall and uh, Charles oh, Sitwell. Yes. And Pedro is right there too. Where's Pedro? Uh, yeah, you he's, cannot, he's you cannot recognize because I was very lean. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he's right in the middle next to Ravi. Yes. Um, he's... He's the person on the left of uh, Dr. Ravi. Yes. Yeah, in the second row from the bottom. Does anyone oh, yeah. else have any questions? Please un unmute your mic uh, in, if you would like to ans ask a question. I'd like, here's May from Wellington, and I'd like to ask you if you've heard anything about what's happening there during, I presume, India's cover and COVID and all that sort of thing, and just how they're managing to um, to cope with, with the current situation. Um, because I, yeah. Uh, the, the president has reported this uh, uh, in his annual report uh, to the convention, also in writing. Uh, because of the seriousness of the pandemic in Chennai, they had to close down a number of activities. First of all, they had to close down the compound to walkers because one, one of the nice features of ADR is that uh, we have issue permits to people to walk from the compound during certain hours of the day. But we had to cancel this because of the risks involved, you know. And um, I believe that a number of departments are working again. And, um, um, but of course the difficulty remains because, excuse me. Um, uh, it was very serious in, in mm -hmm. South India. The, the pandemic was very, very serious. And um, um, the, I think the management managed not, not to have too many residents infected by COVID because of their policies. But the School of the Wisdom is working online. The convention is working online. So these things uh, uh, are there. Um, I believe there is a limited use of the library now. Um, um, there are restrictions everywhere, but um, so uh, the, uh, the ADR as a headquarters is coping well. That's my feeling. 
can, can I ask you about the upgrade, the renovations that were taking place? Um, I presume they've come to a standstill. The last I heard, uh, the Blavatsky Lodge uh, renovation was fully completed. And the, um, I was told that when they were about to complete the renovation of Leadbeater Chambers, the pandemic hit. So uh, I, I don't know if that work has resumed, but I know that most of the work has been done. I, th I, th I think Leadbeater Chambers is completed now. Okay. Oh, Look forward to that. Yes, you've been there, Ismay. I picked you up from the airport. <laughs> yes. Um, it's the 150th anniversary in 2025, so I hope the pandemic will be over and we can all go and visit. <laughs> yes. Why not? Yes. Uh, uh, just uh, uh, out of interest, we had some illustrious visitors at ADR. Uh, Mohandas Gandhi was there for a meeting and so was Rabindranath Tagore. And um, it was Tagore who wrote the independence hymn of India, you know, Vande Matare. And um, uh, he stayed there for a few days. There is a plaque in the Blavatsky Bangalore commemorating his visit. And, um, um, uh, and the, a young resident of Adia, Radha Bournier, when she was much younger, she took part in a film by Jean Renoir called The River. And um, uh, when I was there, she had received, uh, uh, um, uh, how do you call that, um, a master copy of the film by the producer. So she, she gathered some of us in her house and uh, we watched the film and uh, it's a film about India. It's a very beautiful film. And the, old, the director, uh, she told me, after the film was over, uh, he was invited by Sri Ram to stay with his wife for some time at Adyar. And he liked it so much that he decided to retire from filming. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. It's like a lot of people, you know, retire and work over there and, you know, um, some of my old, you know, uh, New Zealand members who were mentors to me, you know, um, Conrad and Helen Jameson. Yeah. Conrad passed away over there, and I know Pedro, you followed his casket to the crematorium. You cycled behind it, um, so you know it has a special place. So, if any of you can ever get there, please do. Yes, uh, uh, for example, you mentioned Conrad. He and Helen worked for so many years, and they were very keen to help people. But Conrad liked to sing in the shower, but it was not <laughs> any casual singing. He liked to sing opera in the shower, you know? And we had a member from Australia who went to Adyar for some yogi courses and so on. He would do that every year. And he, uh, he was a quiet member. And he used to do his meditation very early in the morning. And when he was trying to meditate, Co uh, he was on a room above Conrad. Whenever he was trying to meditate at five o'clock, Conrad would blast his opera singing and this member would come. When I meet him at breakfast, he said, I don't have very kind thoughts towards him. I said, well, that's not in the yoga tradition, is it? <laughs> I see that a few of them have unmuted their mic, James. Um... Suzanne, do you need to, would you like to ask a question? Um, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to um, Pedro and to, to Simon and yourself. I, I did have a question. Somebody told me once, I think it was in Singapore, a beautiful Indian lady who I don't know her name, but she was beautiful, sorry, said that there was a kindergarten for some of the children. Is that what you were talking about, Pedro, for the mothers, their children? Is oh, no, uh, uh, this is different Sorry. because um, a, a new educational activity was started some years ago called Adyar Theosophical Academy. Uh -huh. It has been conceived according to the um, Golden Link School in the Philippines. Uh -huh. And a, a long time Adia resident, Mrs. Sono Murali is the director and they do activities for very small children, including artistic activities and so on. 
So the, there is quite a lot of activities at IDR and, um, um, and many members support these activities sometimes by donating to, there are a number of funds. They have created also the Annie Bazin Memorial Dispensary. Um, and um, they, they, they help quite a lot of animals, including a camel and horses and so on. And, um, uh, and they have been able with the donations to, to buy new material as well. Uh -huh. Thank you for that. I don't oh. know, I, have a co I hope one day I'm able to go and maybe serve there somehow. That would be wonderful. Thank you. James, do you have a question? Oh, well, yes, I do, but it's not um, um, not particularly relevant. Um, but I just want to say, um, Pedro, um, uh, uh, well, many thanks for joining us. That's uh, that's been good. Um, I, I have a question for Vera. I'm I'm just I'm just really interested in where she is. Um, I've, I've I'm sorry, but I've I've not heard of you before, and uh, um, I know she's got a microphone off, but. Uh, um i'm i'm just wondering where whereabouts um and she is right now so maybe uh maybe you can tell me well i'm uh, i'm in auckland i'm in auckland lodge um i am a member for several years and i did is uh, auckland lodge, auckland HPV lodge yes uh, but i'm o originally from prague from czech republic yeah oh, okay. Yeah, I'm looking at the ceiling, it looks 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 really European. And, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's this visual <laughs> background, but uh, yeah, I love libraries and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So That's Vera's the... virtual background, James. She's not in a real place like that. <laughs> it's virtual. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah. Um. I do have a question for you, Pedro. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in um, in what um, um, in what happened between um, HBB and and Olcott um, that that forced them apart at the um, towards the end of her life. And uh, um, I've read various things about it, but uh, I just wondered what um, what you thought, what you think caused that rift. Uh, uh, you see many people hear things um uh, the fact is that uh, uh, his affection for her remain unaltered for example there is a statue in the headquarters hall soon after she died they put her ashes under that statue and they put a statue of her and he wrote on that statue friend this is our testimony but he wrote it in latin um, so, um, uh, there was never a permanent rift. They had what, what is called technically theosophical tiffs, you know, <laughs> the differences of opinion and so on. But for example, when Colonel Alcott was attacked in a manifesto by two eminent theosophists in Europe, uh, uh, calling him a despot and so on, she rose to his defense very vigorously saying, yes, he, he may have some defects, but, uh, but he, he has sacrificed everything for this society. And uh, once uh, Corner Alcott was, such, was under such, such pressure and he decided to resign. And when she heard that he was considering resigning, she said, if you resign, I'll resign and the whole thing is over. And then he reconsidered. So they were different people they were um uh they were tasked with forming this society they had different temperaments but they remain loyal to this society and obviously if he had fallen out with her he wouldn't have put that statue there not only that he even instituted the white lotus day i have seen the original writing by him instituting the white lotus day to remember her every 8th of may with readings of the bhagavad gita and the light of asia and um uh, so uh, uh 
Uh, sometimes people say things without studying uh, the historical evidence, you know, and uh, I have happened to, to, to read his writings uh, and her writings. They, yes, they, they, even, even the, the masters in their letters, they say that um, um, uh, they couldn't find another like him, you know, in, in order to help Madame Blavatsky with her work. It, it's interesting in terms of, um, you know, the work and the personalities, because we all have it. And it's, you know, Annie Besson famously said, if you want to learn brotherhood, get on a committee, you know. Um, so it's like the society is what they gave their work to. And, what, you know, we've given our work to, um, because people come and go, but the society and its ideals remain. And that's what we have to keep in mind, particularly when you're having maybe a few theosophical tiffs, as Pedro has put it. Um, but at the end of that, you know, there's something else which is keeping us here, which is drawing us on. Um, and that's what we've got to touch and keep in mind, which is what Pedro alluded to right at the start of the evening, um, which is kind of a good segue really into, um, we'll just wrap up a bit. Um, uh, Simon, um, um, June oh, yeah. has a mic unmuted she might have a question okay sorry June. yeah yes i do um when you said when um when the property was bought in madras it was called huddlestone gardens which sounds to me incredibly colonial um when and why did it become adya mm. <laughs> Yes, the, the name of that property, particularly uh, the, the, head, the, the headquarters building was called Huddleston Gardens and it was obviously colonial. It had been built in the 1850s, so they say. And, um, but of course, the moment the founders moved there, it became the international headquarters. That was their dream. They wanted a permanent headquarters for the society. And, um, and, um, and, and of course, uh, but in the minds of the members and in the minds of the founders, the name of the place was Adyar because Adyar is the name of the suburb where the society is located. And, um, and there is something very significant there. There is a river, Cornwallcott used to swim in that river. I don't think even Simon would swim in that river today. You know? <laughs> uh, um, uh, uh, there is this river and the river flows to the sea. And there is this notion that whenever that river meets the sea, there is a profound metaphor for liberation. You know, the individual river merges into the sea. So, uh, so there, there were a, a number of things, but yes, when the founders moved there, they started calling it ADR. Yeah, thank you. Okay, any further questions, comments, Pedro? All right, well, I'd like to thank you, Pedro, and thank you, everyone, for attending the Wellington Lodge's first Zoom meeting for the year. Um, we decided to operate for the next few months um, online, which is great, um, um, and um, we'll carry, carry on forward for that. So um, our next series of meetings, we're going to have a theme, which is women, mystics, sages, and seers. So we're going to start that next week um, and I'll do an introduction on the path of the mystic, which will be an introduction to our um, series on women, mystics, sages, and seers, of which, um, not next Tuesday, but the Tuesday after June, who you see here, we'll be doing a talk on early Christian women mystics, the untold story. So Sushma has sent you out the links and she'll remind you um, again. So please join us next uh, Tuesday. Um, for our introduction to mysticism um, in a series on uh, women mystics and sages and seers. So, Pedro, thanks again, and it's great to see you. Please give our regards to Linda. Yes. Um, and great to see everyone.
and look forward to seeing you again next week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, especially Pedro, it's so good. And I hope this is all over soon and we will be able to go Sydney again in May yes. or so. Yes. yes. <laughs> bye. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Thank bye. You. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very Thank much. You. And bye, everybody. Thank you.